I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like my embedded designs are trapped in the past, like 40 years ago or something. I end up with these displays that look like a 1976 digital watch. <laughs> Remember those red seven segment numbers? Lots of blinking LEDs that must be telling the user something important. <laughs> I think it's time to at least enter the 21st century with our embedded user interfaces. But that means we need screens and graphics. Yeah. About the last thing I feel like doing is going back to school to learn how to create a whole graphic system for my next embedded design. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. To keep our embedded designs up to date, we need graphics. My guest today is Kurt Parker from Microchip Technology, and we're going to talk about how you can add a modern graphics user interface to your next design without a bunch of extra engineering work. Sounds good to me. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about Microchip's 32-bit solutions for graphical user interface applications. Welcome, Kurt. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So I've been thinking about adding graphics or some kind of GUI to my embedded designs lately. And I'm curious about what you're seeing in terms of people's general motivation for people and design teams doing this kind of thing. You've probably been thinking about doing that because graphics is one of the largest contributors to user experience. And you're probably in one way or another, either from a desire to increase your business or a desire to meet competitive pressures, needing to increase that or create that user experience that keeps them coming back to your product. Graphics is the largest contributor to that. And there's tons of studies about user interface UI, user experience UX, how important all that is. UX, user experience, drives how someone feels about your product. If they use it, if it's useful for them, if it helps them get done what they want to get done or be happy or accomplish whatever they want to accomplish, they're going to want to come back and use it again and again and again. And that's important because then it drives that preference. So now after a certain number of interactions where they get done what they need to get done, they're looking not just for whatever function it is, whatever thing they need to do, but they're looking for a specific product that gets that done for them in a way that they're either enjoying it or they're getting through it or they're doing it in the way they want to do it. So that preference, driving that preference is so important because that preference leads to more interaction, more sales, leads to more profits right? And that's what we're all doing this for, right? Is to drive that business. So graphics makes a better user experience and the better user experience makes more money? Absolutely. Got it. So what are some of the things you see people trying to accomplish or improve in their designs or products by adding graphics? Some people just want to do more. Some people, they want to add graphics. Some people really want to increase their entire customer interaction. So that includes graphics, it includes touch, it includes motion, it might include audio. Others are already in some kind of graphical user interface, maybe, maybe even just segment display, and they want to go beyond that. Or they have a smaller display, they want to increase the size of the display. They need to maybe add graphics within a certain power budget. They maybe need to be able to add graphics within a certain bill of materials cost budget. There's a lot of things that they need to accomplish or they might have targets that they need to accomplish. And then all of that built on top of the idea that I need to have a better experience for my customer. I want to increase my customer's experience for my product. Yeah, you just hit two of our biggest carabouts, power and bomb cost. Right, right. We hear that a lot. And if you're not familiar with how to implement graphics into an embedded design, you may get into this thought that, oh, it's a much bigger processor, much bigger you know, external controllers and lots of other chips and much more complexity. It's not necessarily the case. It's all a matter of what you're trying to accomplish. The other thing that's really important that you're trying to solve is how do I develop for it? right? I can't just say graphics appear. <laughs> We're not magicians, right? You know, engineers may like to portray themselves. They're solving problems people don't know they have <laughs> in ways that people don't generally understand, <laughs> right? But in fact, they use very specific tools. And if they're not familiar with graphics, they're not familiar with the tools that are available. 
And so they're looking to be able to adopt the ability to implement graphics into their system in a way that is the smallest learning curve possible. Hopefully no learning curve. Smallest cost possible as well. Sure. Hopefully no cost. So should I just Google graphics tools and grab some off the web? Ooh, (laughs) good luck with that, right? You can do a lot of research into a lot of different types of tools, a lot of different types of products. But first thing you want to understand is the impact that making the right decision about tools can have on your business. If you make a wrong decision, tools can lead to bugs. They can lead to slow iterative designs. They can lead to delays in launch of your product. We've seen some studies where if you have a design cycle time of, let's say, 18 months and you have a revenue ramp of three months, so your entire life cycle is 24 months. If you lose three months in a launch delay, then you've lost $1.29 million in revenue and profit on a $10 million peak revenue design. So you're really seeing a impact to the bottom line by just this one choice. I'm not trying to scare everybody, right? But it's important to understand that you can't just grab something. You can't just grab anything. You have to have that balance of being able to get done what you need to get done from a reputable company that works well with all of the other functions that you're doing. Because keep in mind, graphics is an adder to something you're already accomplishing, or it's an increase to something you're already accomplishing. Very, very few designs out there are graphics for the sake of graphics, and those are TVs. And even then, you're doing beyond that. You're getting information beyond that. You're interacting beyond that. So there's more to be done, and it has to interact with all of the other tools you're using that help you get those functions accomplished as well. Yeah, that makes sense. And to your example, I can see how a three-month delay could just be a complete disaster. So if we look at graphics specifically, what are some of the challenges I'll be facing in my design? So first thing you're going to face is the first thing, and that's where do I start? Where do I go? Okay, I know from one of these pressures that we talked about earlier that I have to have graphics, right? I have to incorporate it. Well, how do I learn about graphics and how do I implement it? And where do I find information about these tools? And where do I get training on using the tools? And so that very first barrier is trying to get to know something, get to know what you need to know. And then you also need to understand some of the challenges. In a typical design, it is somewhat iterative. You are dealing with either performance enhancements or bugs or something like that till you get your design to a point where it is shippable. It meets the marketing requirements, documents, and all the other design criteria you have in your system. Graphics adds to that iterative process because it's kind of like an art as well. So if you're really good, you've done the requirements for what the different screens look like that you want to make. But oftentimes you're really making a display and then showing it to a bunch of people and saying, hey, what do you think about this? And somebody from your Marcom group comes over and says, no, I want that logo five pixels to the right. (laughs) So you're back through and you're going through that again, right? Every one of those iterations takes time, takes effort. So it has some costs to it. And so the faster you can go through those iterations, the better off you are. And of course, the fewer iterations you have, the better off you are as well. Then one last thing. So let's kind of talk about the tools a little bit more. You may want to have a very, very similar design setup, and you may want to be able to iterate it across several different levels of product line. So you may have your low end and your medium range and your high end products, and you want to have this very similar look and feel amongst all those, even though you're going to have limitations on display size for your low end and you're going to want your high end maybe to all the bells and whistles, 24 bit color, full color range, things like that. You're going to want those tools to be able to accommodate all that. You're going to want your software and your application to be able to accommodate all that. You're going to want to be able to have it integrate into your backend functions through all of that. And you're going to want to be able to have access to hardware that works with all that together. And you can rapid prototype very, very quickly and easily at low cost for all of those. So those are the kinds of challenges that you're going to face when getting into graphics. Where do I go? You know, um, how do I deal with the art of making graphics and how do I deal with the scale and how, what impacts do add, does that adding graphics have on scalability of my product? Got it. So my team needs to think about being more agile and more about scalability up front in our process. I think that it's good to think about that. It's good to have that realized and understand that. Um, But it's also good to have a partner that provides you with the tools to be able to handle that quickly and easily as well. 
Cool. Okay. So speaking of partners, let's jump into some microchip specific solutions. How are you going to help me out with this? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> I appreciate that. So we offer this MP Lab Harmony Graphics suite and it reduces your total development costs, your development time and your risk. All three of those are important and additive to each other. So first things first, that tightly integrated development environment. So MHGS, MP Lab Harmony Graphics Suite works within MP Lab Harmony, which is our 32-bit microcontroller microprocessor software framework. It is the all-encompassing solution for all of the drivers, all of the software, the code that you need to get your design up and running so you can focus on your secret sauce, your application, what drives your profit for your company. We'll take care of the rest. So it's fully integrated in that. And then with the tools within MHGS are fully integrated into MP Lab X, which is our integrated development environment for not only the 32-bit microcontrollers, microprocessors, but the 16-bit and the 8-bit as well. Great news about all that is, is that if you're familiar with any of those products, then you've already used all the tools. And the software then integrates very, very well. So it really reduces the amount of code you're having to really actually touch. We're restricting the code you have to develop to your particular application. And that cuts development time down by up to 90% in some cases. So another way that MHGS helps you is through that scalable support. So you'll be able to use our graphics development system throughout our product lines in 32-bit. So from Cortex-M0 to Cortex-M4 to Cortex-M7 to the ARM9 and Cortex-A5 products as well. So that helps you with that scalability, and it also helps you, it preserves your ability to design into very high performance to power efficient products in the MPU family, while still being able to stay in your comfort zone in terms of development code, development applications, et cetera. Got it. Okay. That lets me focus more on getting my design done and less on learning a bunch of different development tools. Learning curve is eliminated. And that's so important. And then not having to patch tools from different sources, which oftentimes means you have to extract code from one source and stitch it via C development into your other source, your other code development, Uh huh. which adds time, it adds complexity, and it adds risk because there's potential for bugs in that system. And then finally, you know, we offer tools within MHGS, and I want to highlight something we call Display Manager. So there's specific tools that make your job easier for some of the functions that you may not really realize yet that you're going to have to deal with. So maybe you're not going to use a standard display. Maybe you're going to use something that's long and skinny or tall and skinny or not 16 by 9 and not by a 4 by 3, right? Right. We have a tool that helps you create a driver based on information that's in the data sheet for that display. And it pops out the code for you and it puts it in your application. You don't have to do one bit of C code for that. We have things for handling events. So when you want your graphics to interact with the outside world, we have an event manager that takes care of that. When you want to handle your fonts, and maybe you don't want to carry every single character in every single language within memory in your design, we have a tool that handles that. Multi-language, we have a tool that handles that. So there's a lot of other built-in functions that make this so super easy to use for those who have not really delved into graphics design before and the complexity that could be there. Got it. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit more specifically about the MCUs themselves. Sure. We do offer MCUs with onboard graphics acceleration. So you can have an integrated graphics controller that will not only drive the data to your display directly, but will also handle things like multiple composite layers. So that's helpful if you want to make modifications only portions of your graphic because each layer will be in a different memory area and then your CPU and your graphics processor will only have to deal with that layer. And you can make movements to that layer that doesn't affect any of the other graphics. So if you're not familiar with compositing, just know that it it is a great feature to be able to add professional looking graphics and to also be able to lessen the amount of work that your microcontroller has to do. I mentioned a graphics processing unit. So it has a processor built in that does some very nice rendering for creating shapes and fills. It does some pick and place of 
the graphics themselves from one point to another. And it also does some rotation, some really nice functions that end up being used a lot. So they offload from the CPU. Okay. Again, because your application is likely going to do something more than just graphics, the ability to have those graphics handled by that processor enables many, many more cycles by your main CPU to do whatever other functions and calculation you want it to do. And then it also has high performance memory. So it has a DDR2 DRAM. And our particular device, which is the PIC32 MZDA, has the DDR2 DRAM built into the chip. Okay. So it's got 32 megabytes, a very, very large space that you need to hold your graphics data built right into the chip. So there's no high speed bus development on your own board that you have to do or anything like that. We've taken care of all that built right into the system. So we also offer cost-effective solutions into other spaces as well. Sure. So remember, I talked about that scalability that our tools help you handle. Sure. You know, everything from M0 Plus through M4, through M7, and into the MPUs. Yep. And that's very important for matching the size and performance and power and cost to what you need for your application. You have your choice of the different options available. They generally come with different topologies that they can support as well. Very rarely do you have the ability, for instance, for a Cortex-M0 to be able to drive a large display without some external support. You can drive a really small OLED display, and we have a demo for that. So it's important to understand the different topologies, how graphics can be implemented. We talked about one with the PIC32 MZDA, and that's the one where you have the all of the graphics control and processing and memory and everything built right into the chip, right into the MCU. And all you do is hook it up to a panel and boom, you're ready to go. And you can hook that up into a WVGA panel with 24-bit color, with alpha channels, all kinds of fun stuff, right? And boom, you're ready to go. But that's not the right solution for every design. Other designs need smaller displays and with smaller microcontrollers. Other designs have a graphics controller, which is a separate chip, Either it's a preference based on prior designs in the company, or it's actually a controller that is built onto the display panel. Yep. All of those are perfectly valid and good ways to build graphics into your system, and they each have their benefits and their drawbacks. And so whichever one is right for your design, we have a microcontroller solution for that. Whether you do the direct drive, what we call low cost controllerless, where your microcontroller is doing all the rendering and all of the storage of the frame buffer, what we call frame buffer data, which is basically the data that's being displayed on the display at any given time, right? So if it's doing all its own rendering and all its own frame buffering, then you know, you're going to have a low cost system, very simple to implement. It's going to have maybe some limitations on the number of pixels it can hold or the number of colors it can generate because of the colors determine your memory size. But it's a fantastic, simple solution that's directly interfaced without any external memories, without any external graphics controllers. So your bomb complexity is low, your overall cost is low, your overall performance can still be high because you know, you're running with some 300 megahertz microcontrollers in that category as well. Or if you have an external graphics controller, let's say on the display, or you know you want to have that on a separate chip external, we can support that too. And our tools support all of those configurations. So you can set up drivers for your display, and we provide the drivers for the external graphics controller that you're using. And now you're simply using tools to map out what you want your graphics to look like, the widgets and graphics and colors you're using, etc. Okay, I've got the hardware picture. Let's talk more about the software and tools and drivers and stuff. Outstanding. Let's do that. So MPLAB Harmony Graphics Suite is actually four components put together all under one roof, the MPLAB Harmony roof, to simplify your graphics design and your graphics development. Again, the key here is to reduce and remove all of the tedious, difficult C coding that goes on and get you directly to making awesome graphics that your customers are gonna love and to getting those done quickly in as few of iterations as possible. So we do that through a combination of having great design tools with our designer, 
a full graphics library, which includes widgets and graphics images and text drivers and the ability to create drivers for displays that you want to use and code configuration and code generation so that you can hook up your graphics design into all of the rest of the functionality of your system and have that all under one roof and create your application when it's time to run it and when it's time to push it to your development tools. Okay, so explain to me what the software tool environment looks like. So if you are familiar with what you see is what you get, that is the perfect place for graphics development, whether you're doing this for a graphics display or if you're doing this for a website or if you're doing this for a page or anything like that. You really want to get down to the point where what I put on my canvas is what I'm going to see in my target. And that's what we accomplish with our composer. When you put that cheap in that game right there, it's going to be in that same relative place on the glass in the display. My sheep doesn't have a very good score yet. Right. But, you know, you, with practice and time, you're going to be able to get that up there. There's actually quite a bit going on here that it's important to understand why WYSIWYG is so important. We've pulled in a widget for that scale, that green, yellow, red scale. There's another widget that helps track that score in real time. So that score builds up in real time as you interact with it. There's also the layering that happens here. So we talked about our PIC32 MZDA with the built-in layering functionality in the graphics controller. That causes a parallax effect. So the background actually moves at a different pace from the foreground that simulates speed, it simulates movement of the sheep, even though the sheep is really only kind of moving about an eighth of the width of that display itself. Got it. So there's a lot happening here and all of the different tools in the top left, you have your design tree and your screen manager on the left-hand side, which are helping manage those screens and all those layers. Our widgets toolbox is helping us place and create the widget in such a way as to make it look good and interact with your user the way that you want it to. We're understanding how we're using our memory and how much memory we have available with everything that we add, everything that we put in there. And then we have a tool in here that helps us manage animations so that we can transition from a sheep that stands still, the sheep that's running, to a sheep that's supercharged. It's a supercharged fireball. That one's on fire. I think it's a special sheep from New Zealand. Got it. <laughs> So. Okay, I get how this helps me with the graphics part, but how does that fit into the context of the rest of my system design when I've got no graphics going on at all? And you're always going to have that, right? Like I said before, very, very, very few times are graphics done for graphics sake. You want to have it all connect together. Fortunately, this is our third generation of MPLAB Harmony. So we've got this down to where we integrate all of the different functions, the drivers for the peripherals, the internal configuration of the clocks and the memories and things like that to a point where if you've played connect the dots, you've worked with our configurator. Got it. So you go and you connect all the different components that you need to work together. And then you go into each of the different components and you adjust them not using code but using standard GUI, either drop-down menus or selector checkboxes, things like that, to make it work exactly the way you want it to work. And it generates the code for you. So not only does it generate the code that you need to drive that display, but it generates the code that you need to communicate over that I2C interface. And it generates code that you need to configure that clock to spin as fast as you need it to spin. Perfect. Okay. So also, my team isn't exactly a bunch of artists. You wouldn't have wanted to see what sheep I would have drawn. <laughs> so what can you do to help me design a user interface that looks clean and modern? So there's actually a lot going on in each one. We use a tool and we move a slider, move a button or type on a screen and it's all well and good. But getting that on there from scratch is something that most people cannot and do not want to handle. And so we provide something called widgets. And those are little devices that they look like graphics but they have a depth to them that allows you to configure them to either communicate information or be interacted with in the case of a slider or button, or in some other way, act and perform beyond what just a simple graphic would be. Okay. So we have an entire library for those and configuration tools that are highly intuitive to get you up and running with them very, very quickly. So there's also the ability to add your own images. Let's say you're getting images from your art department within your company or your marketing department within your company. Whatever they send you, you can pull into your system and 
will change it in such a way as so it'll fit into your design. So let's say they're giving you this gigantic full color version of your logo and you need it to shrink down because you're using a Cortex M4 microcontroller with very limited memory space, you can then move that down into a smaller number of colors, a smaller size on height and width. You can watch how it affects your total memory. And then you can also see it in the WYSIWYG design tool, exactly how it looks like, and then very quickly see how it's gonna look like on your glass as well. But there's more because most of the time you're gonna to wanna to have some text in your design. So you're gonna to wanna to be able to add and configure that text. You're gonna to wanna to be able to adjust for multiple languages. Oh yeah. And so we have a tool that helps integrate languages easily. In fact, you can import multiple languages with a spreadsheet into the tool. So now you hand a spreadsheet over to your translation expert, or maybe you do a third party to do translations for you. Please don't use Google Translate, <laughs> right? Please don't do it. <laughs> My tip to you, the listener, do not use Google Translate. No. So your expert then does a translation, not within the tools here, which are fun and easy and fast, but not a translation tool, but within a spreadsheet, which everybody knows and loves. And then you import them from the spreadsheet, incorporates that into the code for you. Got it. So there's touch and event handling because as we've said over and over again, you're not doing graphics for the sake of graphics. So when your user interacts with your design, you want something to happen in the background. Somebody presses a button, you want the nuclear reactor to shut down, right? <laughs> or if it's getting hot, you want that screen to flash red to let you know it's getting hot. So we provide a tool for that. So it really minimizes the amount of code writing you have to do to interact your graphics with the outside world. So you've saved my team from having the world's first all stick figure user interface. <laughs> For nuclear reactor control. And second, you've saved us with the language thing from having my user interface say, it appears to have the thing of danger has occurred, not please pressing of the other button. <laughs> So you mentioned earlier that you're going to protect us from having to write a lot of code and drivers are really my team's nemesis. So what's all involved in setting up drivers? We've been told time and time again that one of the big banes of the existence of people needing to design graphics is they're typically handed a display. Use this display or they're handed a data sheet. This is the display you're going to use because we got a great deal on it. We got a smoking deal on this display and we're going to use this one to make it happen. There was a reason for that. Right? So, and now previously you had to then write a driver or bag, borrow and steal a driver from any possible source you could get your applications engineer, the silicon manufacturer, the panel manufacturer. And oftentimes they don't understand the backend software you're using. Right? So we've created a tool that you can input your data sheet parameters from the display. And if you're not getting a data sheet on the display, you need to go back to your purchasing people and say, hey, right, that there's some minimums here, right? There's some, some minimum amount of information we have to have about these things. Get that data sheet, you put in the parameters from the data sheet and it will pop out a driver for you. So you don't have to write it. And there's more. Remember that what you see is what you get design panel, the design tool there. It will replicate the size, the height and width of that driver into your what you see was what you get tool. So if you're using a display that is not 16 by 9 or 4 by 3, it will actually configure your canvas to the size that you have created so that you can continue with the what you see is what you get design scenario that you've come to know and love with the other display. So it's super cool not only to be able to have that code written for you, we've solved that problem, but then we're also allowing you to stay in that wherever I drop this widget or wherever I put this text is exactly where it's going to be on my display once I hit the button, code's created and gets pushed to my development board or my target. Perfect. So we have an engineer we usually keep locked up in the back just for the purpose of writing drivers. So now we can, I guess, let him out? You can let him out. He can do different things, right? So this whole thing is a little intimidating with all the moving parts we've talked about. Can you tell me a bit more about how it all flows with my system design process? Absolutely. And I'm glad you said system design process because it is iterative. There are steps that you have to take all the way through, whether you're doing graphics or not. Graphics adds a layer to that because you not only have the standard 
design issues of absolute performance, you know, driving all the bugs out and then relative performance, getting it to work as fast as you need it to work in order to accomplish what you want to accomplish. But now you also have an art aspect of this. So if you haven't, even if you have in some cases gone through and designed every page and every screen of what the display is going to look like, then you're going to be tasked with doing some design yourself. You're going to put it together. You're going to show off to a lot of people and they're going to all have their own opinions, right? Right. Everybody has an opinion. They're all going to have your opinions, some of which are valuable, some of which you're actually going to act on. And it's going to cause you to go through the cycle again and again and again, right? So what you want to do is you want two things. You want to re reduce the number of times you have to go through this cycle to get to your final done developed solution. And you want to make the cycles go fast, go as fast as possible, faster, 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 faster. And the way we handle that for you, first of all, we've got all these really cool tools that come into play at different aspects of the design, whether you know, you're in the designer section for adding fonts, managing your images, designing your screens, implementing your widgets, handling your events, or you're configuring that display so that you can have the driver ready to run on your actual hardware. You're configuring it into the rest of the system. You're into runtime now and you need to design to a specific set of APIs or you need to have APIs to design into for your application. And then you put it on hardware and now everybody can see how it works and play with it and manage it. All the way through MP Lab Harmony Graphics Suite is designed and developed to touch each part of this cycle so that you don't have to get into the nitty gritty. You can just focus on your own code. Everything works, works well, quickly, with as few bugs as possible, so you can get it out to market as fast as you can. Okay, so you've talked a few times about the idea of scalability, and our system is going to be deployed in a lot of different form factors and price points and so forth. How do I make it scale? We've talked previously about how the software and the tools can address all of these different levels of architecture. Right. So anywhere from Cortex-M0 to Cortex-M7 to A5, uh, ARM9, we've got some MIPS cores in there as well. And all with the same tools, all with the same code base, adjust up and down as you need to for memories and whatnot. But you'd have a huge gap if you didn't have the hardware to go along with it. And that's where we've designed hardware to be modular and to be scalable and to not only take the configurations that we offer, but to be configurable so that you can add other components into it. So let's say you want to use a Cortex-M7 device, but you want to use your own display in that. So you have a specific connector and a daughter card for that that you want to use. And you want to also populate it with an Arduino shield, or you want to put a micro electronica A to D converter on it, or you want to add Wi-Fi. Because all of that is super configurable and because the software can handle all of that within the tools, you can design and develop your application very quickly with the mix between what we offer and where you want to get those other components. Very cool. So I'm ready to get started. What should I do first to come up to speed on GUI development and all the things I need to understand? And we talked about that too, because it's the first thing, right? The first challenge that anybody getting into right. graphics development is where do I start? Where do I go? We offer so many resources online. I think that picking up our YouTube channel with videos that show you how to get started with our tools, it's microchip minute videos, we have the ability to download software. We also have that, by the way, on uh, Yuku, so the, ch the Chinese version of that as well. Or if it's going to our GitHub repository, which also has a wiki on it specific for graphics with getting started guys with application demo descriptions on there, you can download the software modules directly from there and actually even participate in the development. So there's tons of online resources all searchable because as you can imagine with so much going on with so many cool tools and software and applications and everything the documentation for it it's pretty intense and it can be tens of thousands of pages but it's all searchable and therefore you can get pinpoint exactly to where you want to go very very quickly and easily so we've done a lot of work online to get to that first things first where do i get started so definitely set up for that within the wiki, set up for that within the website, set up for that within the tools. Okay, cool. I have learned a lot. So Kurt, can you just go over the key things that we've learned today? So what you should know is 
We understand the kinds of challenges from start to finish in adding or building graphics into your design. And hopefully we've communicated the importance of graphics in your design, how they drive user experience, which drives preference, which drives profits. Microchip offers the most complete solution, top down, back forth. If you're talking about tools, if you're talking about code, applications, hardware, et cetera, the most complete set of solutions for graphic development out there in the market today. With MP Lab Harmony Graphics tools, with our graphics suite, which includes libraries, demos, everything is very easy to find, very easy to use, and support is thoroughly available online. So I would just say the last thing is it's always a call to action, right? Always asking you to do something, the final ask. Go and download the MP Lab Harmony Graphics Suite. Download MP Lab Harmony as well and MP Lab X for the IDE. All that's free, right? There's even a free version of the compiler. So the MP Lab XC32, MP Lab Harmony C compiler, there's a free version of that. Get working with it, kind of develop with it. It should be very, very simple to dive into. Visit the wiki, go and take a look at all of the information we have, watch some videos. You know, it doesn't take very long. And then go to the link on the screen and that will take you to everywhere you need to go to do all these things and get started with graphics. Great. I'll click on that link right now and get started on my graphics journey. I really appreciate the chance to talk to you today, Kurt. Thank you so much for joining me. I can't wait to see what you create. I really hope to get a chance to take a look at it. Thanks for having me. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about Microchip's offerings for 32-bit solutions for graphical user interface applications. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash EE Journal. <laughs>